So I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Janet Marcher Broder, President of the Alliance for Cell Therapy Now Foundation. So I've worked with Janet uh, for uh, 2015, I think, when we first met. And I am very proud to uh, co-chair with Joanne Kurtzberg at Duke the advisory board for the Alliance for Cell Therapy Now. And this is a very, very interesting organization. It is uh, comprised on the advisory board of many of the leaders in the academic world uh, that are uh, pushing forward cell therapies, cell therapies now in the field of regenerative medicine. And what we are finding in the broad scope of things is that these academic centers and medical research centers, such as W Firm, which is an active member, and Mayo Clinic, and a host of others, have such trouble in the end getting the funding to push promising clinical trials across the finish line. The work of this group was tremendous in developing the provisos of the 21st Century Cures Act uh, for an accelerated uh, consultations, the RMAP provisos with the FDA. The work continues today with the FDA to move in incremental steps the field of cell therapy forward. There's no one that I know inside the Beltway who worked with a, uh, as the director of health of the Bipartisan Policy Center and now is working uh, with the Alliance for Cell Therapy now as its leader that understands how Washington works and how the lobbyist works in building a coalition of lawmakers, bipartisan, to move the field forward. So I'm really honored to present my friend to talk about this so we will understand Capitol Hill advocates and lobbyists. Janet Marchie Brother. Thank you, Bernie. So excited to be here and so excited to talk about this topic. I'm going to, um, so as Bernie said, uh, I've got the privilege and honor um, of convening Alliance for Cell Therapy, an amazing group, uh, primarily academic um, and research leaders in small biotechs and patient organizations to advance change. So I was looking at this topic and I just, introduce myself to most of you, some of the latecomers I, I didn't get a chance to meet with you. And I thought, I wonder what this audience wants to hear. Um, let me just tell you, um, I spent a lot of time lobbying Capitol Hill. Um, going back to the days of, you know, bringing $40 billion to electronic health records uh, across our nation's hospitals and doctor's offices really instrumental um, in getting high tech done. Um, to my work here at Alliance for Cell Therapy, to another group, a standards organization, to getting an appropriation over the last four years to help a small nonprofit. And then here at the Alliance, um, just privileged to help move uh, legislative language, I think, Bernie, we're looking at over the last four years, and we'll see now, they figured out the debt limit ceiling, and we'll see language here later this month to see if we make progress this year as well. So, just getting a sense of who's here. I'm hearing that we've got, well, well first of all, let me say why advocacy is important, and I can tell you that any major changes, whether it's to get accelerated approval for uh, single molecule drugs and biologics through FDA, that wouldn't have happened unless Congress had forced it. Or using real world evidence, or uh, driving um, insurance, you know, greater insurance coverage for Americans. All of these things happen because advocates, and I know Melissa is a big advocate, for funding, you know, move forward and ask their elected leaders to make changes. And so it's an intensely important topic, and I would say for this field, it now more than ever, we need to act, and we need to act together. Um, so it's a really important topic. Um, I got a sense of who's here. It sounds like we've got some small biotechs, some approved products, some in the middle of approval. We've got some 
folks from academic institutions, anyone else? Want to get a sense of who's here and, and what? Uh, patient advocates. Patient advocates. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> um, so I have a talk here on, it's sort of like a 101 on understanding Capitol Hill and how to be successful in advocacy. But I could go anywhere you want. We've got about 10 minutes or so, 10 or 15 minutes. Should I cruise through the slides or? Yeah, yeah. do that, okay. Okay, target audiences. Um, there are three target audiences and for us, and there is some state work here. I haven't been involved, and you've seen some of the right to try laws, but most of what happens happens federally. It happens within federal agencies, primarily the FDA, the NIH, we wish, but not so much right now, ARPA H increasingly, and then in Congress. But most of what happens in these agencies has to be really pushed by Congress. Although, if we want, we talked a little bit about 361 and 351 in our earlier talk, you know, perhaps that could be done with some exceptions and rulemaking that only reside um, in the agency. I'm gonna skip this, or, you know, advocates, yes. which is, so I've seen it, so, so you can do lobbying within an organization. Hospital systems, um, developers, manufacturers, they typically have an in-house government affairs staff. So they pay someone internally. It's hard when you're a startup, but you soon learn. Now I'm just talking about Congress. I'm not talking about the, the regulatory, which requires teams of people, um, <laughs> unfortunately states but um, so a lot of them most people have an in-house uh, person uh, but several nonprofits also advocate and they rely on volunteers and we did that in the beginning but I'll tell you to really get change you have to hire somebody you have to hire outside lobbyists and, and I wish I could tell you that you didn't need to but these, the folks, and, and you'll find that you might need to hire a Democrat with lobbyists and a Republican lobbyist. A lot of times they're not in the same firm. You hire somebody that's got, you know, they're there pounding the pavement, excuse me, sorry, every day. They've got relationships with all the staffers and there's turnover. These folks are young and so their whole job is to connect have lunch, have drinks with, no, you know, texting now. They, um, with the Alliance for Cell Therapy, we had one, two, three, three or four firms at various points in time. Um, so resources are needed. But, you know, in our early days, I can tell you that, um, you know, a coalition, how, I'm going to talk about this in the slides about how to get this done. Um, in the interest of time, because I'm looking at our clock, you know, the key committees of jurisdiction for us, in the House and Senate, you know, who, who drives decision making, it's the Senate Health Committee, the House Energy and Commerce Committee primarily, and then for us, when we're trying to get funding for clinical trials, uh, the Appropriations Committee has been very important, um, but for FDA, it's uh, Senate Health and House Energy and Commerce. And you'll find that the staff at the committee level are really strong. They know their stuff. You can't, it's hard to, you know what I mean? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about strategies for success. Here, uh, I'm gonna try to finish this in about six or seven minutes. So we can. here's uh, strategies for success at a glance, and I'm happy to connect with you later um, if we've gone too fast and you wanna do a deeper dive. The first is, and I find this particularly with a coalition, sometimes we can be 
oh, we want more funding for clinical trials. Oh, you know, you know, you can switch, but you really need to understand your goal. It seems so simple. This is how you run business, right? Or run a big research project. Uh, you've got to figure out what actions need to happen. And then you've got to figure out um, what mechanisms. In some cases, if you just want to tweak in the way that FDA evaluates or applies its rules, um, that probably doesn't need uh, congressional action unless you are seeing a lot of resistance over time and you want to force it, then you probably need a couple of line items in an authorizing bill or in a FDA user fee up reauthorization bill or an appropriations bill. Um, so in the interest of time, so there's a lot of understanding your goal and then being patient. I mean, sometimes, you know, it doesn't, first of all, I can tell you that getting legislative language Folks think, oh, no big deal, let's just go talk to people on the Hill. It's really hard. It, does, it hardly ever happens, actually. And I'm afraid sometimes we've made it seem too easy. It's not easy. It's expensive. It's time consuming. Um, and it takes a lot of stuff in the background. Um, here, and this is for most of you, if you work in an association or you work in a group or you work on your own and you're starting to get ready, here's just some helpful hints. Um, that I've learned. Um, you know, know your facts, make sure you source them, you're gonna get pushback. In this field, we've gotten pushback. Sometimes they'll tell you or sometimes they'll just tell the lobbyist. Also a good, you know, for people that they're close with, like, uh, I don't think that's real or they don't, it's not true or, or this, that, and the other. Um, and then we found actually Oh, you know, I forgot to say, one of the biggest accomplishments was the language in the 21st Century Cures Act. How could I forget that? Um, what we did there is, uh, that was unprecedented. It did, it was expensive. It was very expensive. We had lobbyists, but we also, um, what was in, you know, we had a former Senate Majority Leader who was a Republican. We had a former um, member of the House. We had a Republican and a Democrat. You know, you need to address both sides of the aisle. Uh, we needed to get close to the, the chairman of the committee that would get it through in the bill um, at the Senate Majority Leader. Uh, but where, where was I going with this? Um, uh, what's really helpful, what we did there is we created an expert panel. So we went out, Tony Atala, you know, who is hosting us, was one of those expert panelists, uh, you know, a former FDA commissioner, Andy von Eschenbach, several others, Bernie, um, and, and several others. And we did some research, we talked to stakeholders, and at the Bipartisan Policy Center, you know, issued a white paper. So those things can help you as well as surveys. Um, have a plan. We talked about resources. Again, it's you know, we are with Friends of HL7. It is a coalition, it's totally volunteer. I do it at the in, night and on the weekends. And we got pretty far for two years, but to get to get the number higher and to continue to maintain, we hired a lobbyist. It wasn't very expensive. There was just one and then one volunteer one. Um, but work with your coalition and make sure that you focus and sometimes at ACT Now, you know, have your long-term goals and your short-term goals. Um, and if you're an advocate and you're in charge of this, make sure you try to um, manage expectations. Again, it's really hard. Uh, uh, how do you do this? You build a coalition or not. You get your facts straight. You get your act straight. You determine who your champions are, who needs to move this through. If it needs to move through the Senate Health Committee, and I'm not close to Wisconsin and Senator Tammy Baldwin, who's the chair, chair of the Senate Health Committee, um, you know, let me look at the other committee members. Is there a strong, um, is there someone strong in your coalition? You know, one of the, in a couple of the bills that we moved forward, Bernie connected us with Representative Ted Deutsch. We had a great coalition in Florida who helped us move that and who joined the coalition and did a sign-on letter uh, to get that done. Um, so you'll do meetings, 
you'll do you'll do letter writing, you'll do phone calls. It's a big it's a campaign. I'm looking at Melissa. She's the expert in getting this done. Email campaigns. And now during COVID, it's so funny. You'll see them long lines going into the Senate and House office buildings. All the associations do their fly-ins. So everybody comes in and they've got their materials and then they go member to member, large groups, and it's highly effective. Highly effective. Um, the other thing that's important that we did a lot of um, that you want to consider is your earned in social media and events. We do a lot of congressional briefings on Capitol Hill. You serve lunch because young 20-somethings would, you know, maybe they're not totally into your topic, but if they're going to grab lunch, you know, so we've had really good luck with, with um, briefings on Capitol Hill. And then you want to target, you need to know your members of Congress and you need to target the media, what they read. You know, the Politico Hill, there are some things that they all read um, in Washington that are helpful and get credible spokespeople to write op-eds. Former members of Congress help. Um, maybe a patient and a former member of Congress, maybe a doctor and a patient, um, but having someone who can influence is important. And then finally, with social media, for those of you involved in social media, you know, you know, that's really important, particularly for the congressional staffers. And now through paid digital, you can really target zip codes and where they'll read, and you can do paid. Uh, and it's fairly inexpensive. You can also do that ads pop up that look like white papers, but aren't, you know, but they're paid. <laughs> and it doesn't look like that. So we did, we experimented with that, which was quite effective. But only, not everybody in the country, but only that one little area, you know, around Capitol Hill. Um, finally, power and numbers. Coalitions are good. It helps you expand your, um, it's great to look at the whole list of organizations, and Bernie has been incredibly effective in helping us build a coalition to move this forward. Um, so coalitions are good. Um, they can be tough sometimes. It depends. Like if you're just for increasing dollars for clinical trials, that's motherhood and apple pie. Sometimes you get in the definition if it leaves somebody out, you know, then you can get some pushback. But when you have narrower issues, it's harder to build a coalition with a lot of infighting and then maybe it comes back to bite you because uh, folks don't. Folks want something different, so they may fight you. Um, and then finally, I threw this in at the last minute when I was uh, key skills of successful advocates. Really good at, uh, it's not just like what you may see or hear about. You know, lobbyists do get a bad rap sometimes. It's not just, you know, going out and, and you know, there's a lot. Um, you need to know your stuff. I mean, the committee staff and, and a lot of the health LAs are really, really strong, and they scrutinize, and, and so you've got to be very persuasive um, in your writing, uh, in your oral communications. You've got to work with your advocates to make sure they don't go too long and don't go on tangents. You've got to get to the point in about two sentences, but it's got to be clear uh, and impactful. You have to have good judgment, flexibility, and most of all, patience, tenacity, diligence. You know, it's tough, it's a slog. Um, but the good news is, is when you're successful, you can really drive real, big, impactful change, and that's why advocacy is important. So that's my quick, <laughs> my quick overview. So, thank you. organize a caucus in Congress <laughs> where there are only a few, about 400. So yeah. what, can, what can that do? Can advocates promote that? Who is, the, who is in charge of a caucus? Help us understand. So what Bernie's referring to, and he um, reminds me, and thank you for reminding me, it is a big goal. So what is a congressional caucus and why is it important? 
So congressional caucuses are formed on Capitol Hill, and they're led by members of Congress, usually mostly on the House side. And so there's caucuses on aging and frailty. There's caucuses on Alzheimer's or cancer, um, on um, you know a whole host of issues. And there's about 400. And what we have had to do, because we didn't have a caucus, is we had to go door to door, office to office, convincing, you know, matching our members with, you know, looking at where, uh, West Virginia, <laughs> Pennsylvania, um, Texas, Florida, um, and uh, really, you know, trying to, blocking and tackling. What a caucus does, it's an educational effort, and they usually don't happen unless you help create it. And we act now, it has a purpose, and we've start, we've begun outreach to build a caucus. And so members join the caucus, and you do briefings with members on the Hill. You know, you launch a caucus, you do briefings, you do educational sessions, you have experts come in, and there's no real legislative change. It's very much an educational forum. And so what happens is you've got a ready-made caucus, so when you do have recommendations legislatively, you've got a ready-made group of influencers and champions, and that's really important. And at ACT Now, we focus so much on the legislative aspects that the caucus always goes to the wayside, but we promise that we'll focus on it beginning this summer. Well, if I could editorialize, uh, the, the caucus is a great idea, but it's not necessarily the only idea to go along. The key, and I think, if you can back me up, is knowing what you want and what change, if any, or what kind of legislative language you're trying to assert. How are you going to move what your issue is forward? And without that, the caucus is great to, to hobnob with our politicians, but there's the next step. How do you get it? And in my work, over years in co-chairing the advisory board, I can't begin to tell you how complex it is, really, and how much work goes on behind the scenes to identify lawmakers, to meet with the staff members, occasionally the lawmakers in a Zoom call, but usually a staff member, and you want to have a constituent in your advisory board or expert that's supportive of this. If someone knows the lawmaker, it's even better. Janet is an expert at organizing this and then managing the expectations of the luminaries <laughs> that are speaking to the lawmaker. <laughs> Bernie, be careful, don't go too long. I said, I'm not points. the problem. I'm not the problem, Janet. I know, but I'm a lawyer. So but having a, 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 a person that's knowledgeable inside the beltway and navigate this, it, to get the language in the appropriations bill for the past two appropriations or so, supportive of regenerative medicine. <laughs> that alone was heroic, but it's a reference and it shows congressional support for our field. And that's very significant to build public support and understanding and as a reference point moving forward. May I do one more thing before we close? So we've got this great group of people. I'd love to hear um, if there was one thing that we needed to advocate or lobby for in Congress, what would it be? Um, I'm going to take, I'm going to pull out three topics. Raise your hand and then you give me another if I haven't. Um, more funding at the NIH or ARPA-H for clinical trials by hand. Is that your number one issue? Well, I don't know. It depends on the other so, issues. So pick, all right, I'm going to lay out three and then you tell me your number one issue. So number one, funding for clinical trials. Number two, modifying our regulatory framework to more appropriately reflect and align with the, uh, how can I say? Innovation. The, um, with, uh, with the unique characteristics of cellular cell-based therapies. In other words, modify the existing regulatory framework. Uh, three, workforce development. That's, those are three. Okay. okay, so so everyone for the clinical trials, one, two, 
Okay, regulatory framework. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, and then workforce development. Oh, I like that too. Oh, that's jobs, good. Jobs, jobs. Yeah, there, there was a GAO report on workforce development. It's not clear what the government role is. Yeah, regulatory framework, that's a tough nut. We're going to need a big coalition and we're going to need money to get that done. That is very difficult. But we did make a lot of progress with the 21st Century Cures Act. Uh, they weren't up for conditional approval back then. But you know, the mood has changed. I think FDA's thinking has changed. I think we're at a critical point in time where we can hopefully make some progress there. But with that, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.